Watch out, watch out. You guys got to watch out. Hey, listen now. Four quarters, 60 minutes, and we're the champion. Let's go, baby. Port of call, Caribbean. Right from the very first play, Super Bowl XII was a coach's nightmare. And Butch Johnson dropped the handoff. It was fiercely fought, but frightfully flawed. They got Starbuck. Fumble! Denver has it. No, there's no official indication yet. Hold it. The Denver players say they have it. Dallas got it. Dallas got it. The game set Super Bowl records for the most fumbles, most turnovers, and most penalties. It lacked structure and style, but not intensity. And they may call face masks. And the Cowboys are really going to protest because Charlie Waters was clearly being held by the man blocking him. But I think Charlie also grabbed the face mask of the blocker. And Tom Rafferty's getting into it with somebody. Craig still has it and wants it all. Going deep for Haven Moses. He's open. And now he's down. It's intercepted by Denny Bourne. The ball hung up in the air, allowing Denny to get it. Robach flips to the left side. Fires deep for Dupree at the 10. Billy Joe fumbles the ball. It is recovered down at the 15-yard line by the Broncos. And now the ball, what an emotional game. Now it's swinging back the other way. Fourth play action, back to pass. Fires it out and it's intercepted again. Mark walks into the 40, to the 50. why that ball was intercepted because Ed Jones was all over Craig Morton like ugly on an ape as they used to say when I was in school. The interceptions and fumbles punctuated a drama dominated by two outstanding defenses. Different in design but equal in effect. Denver's emotional orange crush defense buried the Cowboys under an angry avalanche of swarming defenders. While the orange crush performed as a group, Dallas's doomsday defense was a series of splendid solos. Number 54, defensive tackle, Randy White. Defensive end, number 72, Ed Joe. Defensive end, Harvey Martin, number 79. While Dallas went after Craig Morton with its front four, Denver used its linebackers to lead the assault on Roger Starbuck. The Bronco linebackers disrupted the Dallas offense with a daring variety of blitzes, and Starbuck was sacked four times in the first half. But in one respect, Denver's play was as disappointing as it was successful. All season long, their defense had won games by capitalizing on opponents' mistakes. But today, Denver let each opportunity slip through its grasp. The Cowboys fumbled three times in the first five minutes, and Denver failed to make a single recovery. This one simple fact tipped the balance of the game in the Cowboys' favor. Their defense made the big plays that Denver's did not. Four times in the first half, the doomsday defense 
intercepted Craig Morton. Denver's offense passed out gifts like a department store Santa Claus. And the hustling cowboys gleefully scooped up the goodies. Well, there are going to be so many things to talk about when this was over. Dallas's offense managed to convert three of the turnovers into scores. Two of them resulted in field goals. And after one interception, the Cowboys gained possession of the ball on the Denver 25. And from there, Tony Dorsett, number 33, led them to the first touchdown of the game. of a bizarre and brutal first half, Dallas led 13 to nothing. The 43-yard field goal for Denver's first score of the game. Despite the offensive disasters of the first half, the Broncos were only 10 points behind, and their Here's spirit got an added boost but it seemed as if Dallas would continue to have trouble holding on to the ball. Fumbles the ball, picks it up, nailed as he gets to the 21-yard line. Second fumble for Butch today. It's not starting off as Butch Johnson's day, exactly. Fumbling that kickoff, fumbling the double reverse handoff on the Cowboys' first offensive play of the day. Okay, everybody ready? Let's go. Cowboys get it for the first time in the third quarter. They've Red right, tower 49 near Geo. It's on two. It's on two. Ready? Break. <laughs> Johnson's fumble was just an unpleasant reminder of the chaotic first half, and it was soon forgotten as all the parts of Tom Landry's intricate offense began to function in their prescribed pattern. Porter Landry used his running backs as primary passing targets. When Denver's linebackers finally closed down on this maneuver, Landry then instructed Starbuck to use the running backs as blockers instead of receivers. The running backs cut down the rush of Denver's troublesome linebackers, and for the first time in the game, Starbuck had time to locate late opening receivers downfield. The Cowboys' fast action shotgun blasted open holes in Denver's defense, then demolished it with one booming bullseye. A three-man rush again. Roger goes deep across the middle. Way downfield and... Hart drives the court! Touchdown! A sensational diving catch by Bart Johnson, the Cowboys! Second-tier wide receiver! Take back everything we said about Butch not having a big day. He's fumbled it a couple times, but 
I'll tell you what, people talk about the greatest catch ever in a Super Bowl, and they talk about something that Lynn Swan made against Dallas two years ago. Butch diving, he caught that ball parallel to the ground at about the three-yard line. It was a sensational catch by Johnson. The touchdown was a spectacular play that Denver seemed prepared for, but still couldn't stop. It was third and ten. Denver was expecting a pass, but there is no adequate defense for the catch that Butch Johnson made. The Broncos trail by 17 points and they seem to be treading water, too buoyant with spirit and defense to sink, but too empty of offense to move. Just as it seemed as if they might drown, the sea parted. And through it came number 80, Rick Upchurch. Desperate for some offense, Red Miller replaced the battered Craig Morton with Norris Weiss, number 14, a younger and more mobile quarterback. inspired the Denver offense, and they fought to their first touchdown, a three-yard plunge by rookie Rob Lytle. A streetcar named Desire once ran here in New Orleans, and it suddenly seemed as if the Broncos' offense had found it. Now, if it could only carry them to a few more scores, their world championship dreams would come true. This is your month, Austin. As the fourth period began, Denver's determined offense still needed more restoration work from Norris Weiss. What it got instead was a demolition job from the doomsday defense. fierce pass rush that had destroyed Craig Morton was now supplemented with an occasional blitzing linebacker and Weiss fell into desperate trouble. Weiss five yards back has the snap. Here comes the rush. He's up in the pocket. He is there, he fumbled the ball, there's a chase for it, and the Cowboys have recovered! Dallas has the ball at the 30-yard line! That is the eighth turnover by the Denver Ford Goals this afternoon! A 
another decisive move by the doomsday defense had opened the last door to the most treasured victory in football. I don't know why, uh, Vern, but I just have the feeling that uh, Tom Landry might have a gadget that he might want to use in a situation like this somewhere here, one of those trick plays. Ooh, hot, hot. Pitch out, Newhouse goes left, pulls up, wants to pass. Fires it deep for goalie Richards. Robert Newhouse's touchdown pass not only settled the game, but offered a useful lesson in the Dallas style of winning. The touchdown play did not really catch Denver by surprise. Golden Richards was properly covered. It was simply a deadly accurate pass and a remarkable catch. Another precisely executed play against which there is no adequate defense. The kind of big game-breaking play the Cowboys had made all afternoon on defense as well as offense. The best explanation of Super Bowl XII came from Denver's Jim Turner. We were out there thinking about winning, he said, and they were out there thinking about football. The man doing all the thinking was Tom Landry, who once again delivered an entertaining lesson in winning football. In Super Bowl XII, it was a lesson on how a superbly conditioned team of eager athletes can pry open a tough, hard-hitting game and extract from it the stuff of victory. Hey, hey. I think they should be looking at both of us. When we do our lifts on the ice, there's a lot of blade control involved, but we don't always think about that because it seems more natural to us than it did when we were first learning lifts. And it's just important now to keep the lifts in control. We've matured now physically as people, and it's helped us in our skating style on the ice. And now making their appearance near the ice for the first time, Ty Babylonia. There she is, her partner, Randy Gardner, you saw a moment ago. And there's their coach, John Nix, whose head just came into the picture. So the, la the only time that Americans ever won the Paris Championship 29 years ago, John Nix, the coach there, finished second skating for England. We'll be right back with their performance. Introducing Hertz Takeoff Rates. Save up to 50% on the average weekday rental when you take off Thursday through Sunday for a minimum of two to three days. Take off in a subcompact for only $13.95 a day. Paramount's $15.95. Granada, $17.95. Thunderbirds, $21.95 a day. All with no charge for mileage. There are some restrictions, so check with Hertz. Take off next weekend with Hertz Low Takeoff Rates. Three unidentified 19-inch color TV pictures, each the best of its brand. Over a thousand people saw them and picked the one with the best overall picture. They didn't pick America's biggest seller, Zenith, or the second biggest, RCA. Over 60% picked the 19-inch Sylvania Superset. Over 60%. We're not the biggest, but a lot of people think we've got the best picture. The Sylvania Superset. Sunday on Battlestar Galactica, Apollo and Starbuck meet a space spirit only they can see. Then, Peter Strauss. I'm gonna win a gold medal. A three-time loser gets one last shot. In the Olympics. At getting out of hell. All right. Jericho Mile. Tomorrow. Since their competition.
Champion started in 1908. Only one American pair has ever won this championship. Carol and Peter Kennedy in 1950, 29 years ago. This then is a very big moment for American figure skating. And they are the leaders. And the first of their program, the first five or six moves are the power moves and the difficult ones. They open first with a throw, triple Salkow. Very nice. A good start. There next, a split double twist. Here it is. That was nice. The difference with the looseness with which she landed compared to some of the Russians in the earlier movements are the difference in maturity. position look at the extension the oh, beautiful that. very very fun one arm swan lift into a star lift side by side splits double flips and a throw double axle it is, watch him lift her. Nice, nice, nice. What they are doing is skating with control. They know that they are the champions so far, and they're showing it every inch of the way. Steady, secure, and complete. Hi, Babylonia, age 18. Randy Gardner, 20. They're both from Los Angeles. Five years ago, they were the youngest pair ever to represent the United States. Now, as Dick said, more mature, much more. These Arabians pull. Look at the energy and the snap to them. And a... Don't they know it, too? Look Whoa. at the faces on them. Phase one, you might say, is finished as they reach the two minute and 20 second mark. Still a long way to go. They look like champions up to here.
the final move, their death spiral. If they don't... This could be a little sporting history. The end of their program. Here it is, a death spiral. He has only not to go off the edge, so she too. And there it is. It is it. By Babylonian and Randy Gardner. Again, the Paris Championship started in 1908. Only one American pair has ever won the World Championship. The Kennedys in 1950. And now supported by a big crowd of Americans here. Ty and Randy may have done it. They sure look like they think they've done it. Remember, the lead was very, very small, however, over the Russians. Isn't that a great scene? Isn't that beautiful? The 18-year-old girl, 20-year-old young man, now hugging her coach, John Nix. As I said, 29 years ago, when Americans won this championship, John Nix finished second with his British partner, picking up the flowers that have been thrown to them on the ice, a little attendance they always have.